Specific heat capacity. The temperature of a substance can be increased by absorbing heat. This can be seen, for example, when a pot of water is heated on a hot plate. By removing heat, on the other hand, the temperature can be reduced. This is the case, for example, when the pot of water is placed in the refrigerator. The extent to which the temperature changes when heat is supplied or removed depends to a large extent on the substance. Compared to many other substances, water, for example, reacts to a heat input only with a relatively small increase in temperature. This also applies to the reverse case. When heat is released, the temperature of water decreases only very slightly compared to many other substances. Such a slow response of the water to a heat transfer can be seen very clearly in the climate, for example. In regions that are close to large water reservoirs, the temperature fluctuations over the course of the year are significantly lower than in regions without large water reservoirs. The climograph shows the average daily temperature of the cities of Aberdeen and Green Bay in comparison. It can be seen that Green Bay, located on the Great Lakes, has lower average daily temperatures in the warm summer months than Aberdeen, located further inland. In the cooler winter months, however, Green Bay's average daily temperatures are at a higher level. Thus, in Green Bay, summers are not as hot and winters are not as cold. The reason for the smaller temperature fluctuations is due to the fact that water changes its temperature less when heat is absorbed in summer or dissipated in winter compared to the land masses. This has a moderating effect on the temperatures in the surrounding regions. The question arises how to calculate the temperature change for a given amount of heat to be absorbed or released for the different substances. Or, to put it the other way round, what amount of heat must be transferred in order to achieve a certain change in temperature? To answer this question, we first consider which variables for a given substance have any influence at all on the heat energy required if a certain temperature change is to be achieved. On the one hand, the amount of the temperature change to be achieved influences the required heat. It can be assumed that the greater the temperature change to be achieved, the more heat must be supplied to a substance. The daily experience of heating water on the stovetop shows this. The stronger the water is to be heated, the longer the water must stand on the hot plate until a sufficiently large amount of heat has been transferred to the water. At this point, we can only assume that a temperature change twice as large also requires twice the heat. In fact, we will see later in the experiment that this assumption is true for many substances. The temperature change delta T to be achieved, and the heat energy Q required for this, are therefore proportional to each other. Moreover, we will see that within certain limits it does not matter whether the substance is to be heated, for example, from 20 to 30 degrees Celsius, or from 70 to 80 degrees Celsius, as long as the same temperature change is to be caused in all cases. The mass of the substance to be heated has a further influence on the heat required for a desired temperature change. It can be assumed that the more mass is to be heated, the more heat must be supplied to the substance. Again, this is already shown by everyday experience when heating water on the stovetop. Heating a large amount of water takes much longer than heating a smaller amount. The larger amount of water must therefore be left on the hot plate for much longer until it has absorbed a sufficiently large amount of heat to achieve the same temperature change. At this point, we can again only assume that a mass twice as large also requires twice the heat. Just imagine that you would divide the doubled water mass into two equal parts, each of which requires a certain heat for the heating. The two hot plates would therefore transfer twice the amount of heat in total. It can therefore be assumed that the mass M to be heated and the heat energy Q required for this are also proportional to each other. Whether the assumptions made about the proportionality between temperature change and heat or between mass and heat actually apply will be examined in the following using the heating of water as an example. For this purpose, a certain mass of water is heated with an immersion heater and the temperature is recorded during this process. The experiment is then repeated with different amounts of water. For a mass of 1 kilogram, the diagram shows the course of the temperature at a power of the immersion heater of 500 watts. While we can determine the mass to be heated with a balance and measure the temperature change with a thermometer, we must first think about how to determine the supplied amount of heat. After all, we want to examine which heat energy led to which temperature change, and not after which time which temperature change was achieved.
This is actually easier than one might expect. We can determine the heat energy emitted by the immersion heater at any given time by its electrical power. If the immersion heater has an electrical power of 500 watts, then this power specification as the quotient of energy and time means that every second 500 joules of heat energy are emitted by the immersion heater, and with this amount of energy the water is heated. Note that the electrical energy of the immersion heater is completely converted into heat, and thus the heating power corresponds to the electrical power. So, after we have recorded the course of the temperature at constant heating power, we can now convert the time axis in the diagram into a heat axis by multiplying the time by the heating power. In this way, we obtain at each point in time the total heat supplied up to that point. This heat energy is ultimately responsible for the corresponding temperature change. Note that we express the heat in the unit kilojoules because of the large values. Let us now take a closer look at the heat temperature diagram obtained. It shows a linear relationship between the heat supplied and the increase in temperature. Due to the linear course, it is immediately clear that supplying a certain amount of heat Q always leads to the same temperature change delta T. Note that at this point we distinguish between the total amount of heat QT supplied to the water up to a certain point in time T and the heat Q supplied within a certain time period, which is responsible for a corresponding temperature change delta T. We now see that, for example, the same amount of energy of 64 kilojoules has to be supplied for a temperature increase from 20 to 35 degrees Celsius as for the temperature increase from 45 to 60 degrees Celsius. The same amount of heat of 64 kilojoules must also be supplied for heating from 70 to 85 degrees Celsius. Thus, for liquid water, the temperature itself has no effect on the amount of heat that must be absorbed to cause a certain temperature change. We will discuss this in more detail later. The linear increase in temperature also shows that, for example, twice the change in temperature requires twice the amount of energy. For the temperature change of 15 degrees Celsius, a heat energy of 64 kilojoules must be supplied. If we want to change the temperature twice as much, which means by 30 degrees Celsius, twice the amount of heat of 128 kilojoules is now required. Correspondingly, three times the temperature change also requires three times the amount of heat. Heat and temperature change are, as already assumed at the beginning, actually proportional to each other. Let's now look at the result of the experiment when it is carried out with only half the amount of water. We see that the temperature rises twice as much within a certain time. If, on the other hand, twice the amount of water is heated, the temperature rises only half as much. We now see that if the same temperature change is to be achieved in both cases, twice the amount of heat must be supplied for twice the amount of water, and only half the amount of heat energy is required for half the amount of water. Whereas the original amount of water requires an energy of 42 kilojoules to heat the water by 10 degrees Celsius, twice the heat energy of 84 kilojoules is necessary for twice the water mass. With half the water mass, on the other hand, the required heat is half to only 21 kilojoules. The heat required and the mass to be heated are therefore actually proportional to each other, as already assumed at the beginning. The evaluation of the experiments thus shows that the amount of heat is proportional to the desired temperature change as well as proportional to the heating mass. Therefore, the required heat is proportional to the product of mass and temperature change. This relationship applies not only to water but, within certain limits, ultimately to any substance. If we carry out the experiment with a 1 kg aluminum block instead of water, for example, and heat it with the same heating power, then we also obtain a straight line in the diagram. Although the temperature rises faster in this case, it is still true that twice the heat is required for twice the temperature change to be achieved. The proportionality between heat and mass also still applies. If the aluminum block is twice as heavy, then twice the amount of heat must be absorbed to achieve the same temperature change. For other selected substances with a mass of 1 kg, the diagram shows the corresponding heating curves at a heating power of 500 watts. Thus, nothing changes in the derived relationship that the heat to be supplied is proportional to the desired temperature change and to the mass to be heated. Only the absolute amount of heat required depends on the heated substance. This is ultimately described by a substance-dependent quantity which, as a proportionality constant, 
then provides the concrete relationship between temperature change, mass, and the required amount of heat. This proportionality constant is called specific heat capacity C. This quantity is different for each substance and describes how much heat is actually required to change the temperature of a substance. For water, the specific heat capacity has a value of 4.2 kJ per kilogram and Kelvin. This means that 4.2 kJ are required to increase the temperature of a water mass of 1 kg by 1 Kelvin or 1 degree Celsius. Consequently, for times the amount of water, which in this case means a mass of 4 kg, requires 4 times the amount of energy. If, in addition, the temperature is to be heated not only by 1 Kelvin, but by 3 Kelvin or 3 degrees Celsius, then 3 times the heat is required. Thus, by multiplying the mass and the temperature change with the specific heat capacity, the total heat required is obtained. This example shows the structure of the formula once again. The specific heat capacity not only provides the relationship between absorbed heat and temperature increase for heating. This material parameter also applies to cooling. In this case, the specific heat capacity provides the relationship between a dissipation of heat and the resulting decrease in temperature. If, for the sake of simplicity, we only speak of a heat supply in the following, then the considerations may also apply in principle to a removal of heat. But note that the derived relationship between a heat transfer and the resulting temperature change is only valid if the state of matter does not change. For such phase changes like melting or vaporization additional heat is required, which is also called heat of transformation or latent heat. We will discuss such phase changes and the associated heats of transformation in more detail in another video. The table shows the specific heat capacities of selected substances. In addition, the diagram shows the temperature curves for a mass of 1 kg for a heating power of 500 watts. Compared to water, aluminum, for example, has a specific heat capacity of only 0.9 kJ per kg and Kelvin, so that in this case only 0.9 kJ are required to heat 1 kg of aluminum by 1 Kelvin. Aluminum thus requires much less heat to achieve the same temperature change. Conversely, this means that the temperature consequently rises more quickly for a certain amount of heat. Therefore, the lower the specific heat capacities, the steeper the straight lines in the diagram. Apart from the gases helium and hydrogen, liquid water has a very high specific heat capacity compared to other substances. Heating or cooling water therefore generally requires a relatively large amount of energy to be supplied or removed. However, this does not always have to be a disadvantage because, conversely, this ultimately also means that water only reacts to a heat supply or heat removal with a relatively small change in temperature. We can see this directly if we solve the given formula with respect to the temperature change. The greater the specific heat capacity in the denominator, the smaller the temperature change for a given amount of heat. This is why water is particularly suitable as a coolant or as a medium for transporting heat in radiators. When used as a coolant, the water therefore remains cold for a relatively long time despite the heat absorbed, or it remains warm for a relatively long time when used in a heating circuit. The large specific heat capacity of water is also the reason for the less extreme temperature fluctuations in the climate diagram shown at the beginning for Green Bay compared to Aberdeen. At this point a small example for the use of the derived formula. 2 liters of water are to be heated from 20 to 80 degrees Celsius with an immersion heater. The question is how much heat has to be absorbed by the water. To do this, we first need the specific heat capacity of water, which in this case is 4.2 kJ per kg and Kelvin. We obtain the mass of water to be heated from the volume of 2 liters, which corresponds to a mass of 2 kg. Now we need the temperature change to be achieved, which in this case is 60 degrees Celsius, since we want to heat the water from 20 to 80 degrees Celsius, which means by 60 degrees Celsius in total. Be careful at this point. Because in physics it is usual to use SI base units in the formulas. The SI base unit of temperature is Kelvin, and not degrees Celsius. We must therefore also specify the temperature change in the unit Kelvin. To do this, we must first convert the initial temperature of 20 degrees Celsius and the final temperature of 80 degrees Celsius into the unit Kelvin. In the Kelvin scale, 20 degrees Celsius corresponds to a temperature of 293 Kelvin, 
and the temperature of 80 degrees Celsius to a value of 353 Kelvin. If we now calculate the temperature change in the Kelvin scale, we get a value of 60 Kelvin. So we see that it makes no difference at all in the temperature value whether we indicate the change in temperature in the unit degrees Celsius or in the unit Kelvin. The values are identical in both cases. Note that this only applies to temperature changes, not to absolute temperature values. This also no longer applies to temperature differences in the Fahrenheit scale. If we now use the temperature change of 60 Kelvin in the given formula, then we finally get an amount of heat of 504 kilojoules which are required to heat the water. Note that the specific heat capacity was expressed by the unit kilojoules, and therefore the amount of energy is also calculated in this unit. Now we would like to determine how long the heating takes if the immersion heater has an electrical power of 800 watts and heat losses are neglected. With the already mentioned definition of power as the quotient of energy and time, we can answer this question. In this case, the term energy refers to the heat emitted by the immersion heater and the term power refers to its heat output, which corresponds to the electrical power of 800 watts. So the question is after what time the immersion heater at a power of 800 watts has emitted a heat energy of 504 kilojoules and thereby transferred it to the water. Therefore, we solve the shown formula with respect to time. If we put in the respective values, we express the heat energy not in the unit kilojoules, but without unit prefix as 504,000 joules. Note that the unit watt can also be expressed as joules per second. In this way we can see that the calculated time is given in the unit second. Thus, the heating of the water requires 630 seconds. This corresponds to a duration of 10 minutes and 30 seconds. However, we have neglected heat losses in this consideration. Therefore, we would like to discuss the question of how the heating time changes if, for example, only 75% of the heat generated by the immersion heater is actually absorbed by the water. Let us first take a closer look at the power of the immersion heater. The heat emitted by the immersion heater within a certain time can be determined by solving the given formula with respect to the heat QE. Without taking heat losses into account, we have so far assumed that this heat emitted by the immersion heater is completely absorbed by the water. Of course, this does not correspond to reality, because the heat emitted by the immersion heater is not used exclusively for heating the water. For example, the heating power of the immersion heater is also used to heat the vessel. In addition, heat also penetrates through the vessel and thus heats up the floor on which it stands, as well as partially the surrounding air. These unwanted heat flows, which ultimately do not contribute to the actual heating of the water and are therefore not transferred to the water, are referred to as heat losses. The efficiency with which the water is actually heated is taken into account by introducing a factor eta. This factor indicates what percentage of the emitted heat from the immersion heater is actually used to heat the water. So if we multiply the emitted heat of the immersion heater with this efficiency eta, we get the heat actually absorbed by the water. Replacing the heat emitted in this formula by the product of the electrical power of the immersion heater and time, we obtain the shown formula for the heat actually transferred to the water. Finally, by solving this formula with respect to time, we obtain the heating duration taking into account the heat losses. At this point, we do not indicate the efficiency of 75% as a percentage, but as a decimal number of 0.75. We now obtain a time duration of 840 seconds. This corresponds to 14 minutes. Note that the derived formula also applies to an ideal heating process. In this case, the efficiency is then simply assumed to be 1, so that 100% of the emitted heat is absorbed only by the water. In the following, let's take a closer look at the specific heat capacity of water. Strictly speaking, this value is not a constant quantity, but depends to a greater or lesser extent on the temperature. For liquid water, the diagram shows the dependence of the specific heat capacity on the temperature. The minimum value of the specific heat capacity of liquid water is about 4.18 at a temperature of 40 degrees Celsius, and the maximum value is about 4.22 at a temperature of 0 degrees Celsius. Thus, it does make a slight difference whether the water is to be heated by a certain amount at 0 or 40 degrees Celsius.
However, if an average value of 4.2 kJ per kilogram and Kelvin is assumed for liquid water, the deviation from the maximum or minimum value is less than 1%. Thus, for many practical cases, the specific heat capacity of liquid water can actually be assumed to be constant. However, if the water changes into the gaseous state, the specific heat capacity changes very strongly. The specific heat capacity drops to only about half of the original value. But even in this state of matter, the specific heat capacity can be considered almost independent of the temperature. However, the situation is different for frozen water. In this case, the specific heat capacity changes very strongly with the temperature. For low temperatures, the specific heat capacity decreases more and more and is even zero at absolute zero. Such a behavior does not only show water but every substance. For any substance, the specific heat capacity becomes zero as absolute zero is approached. Let us now discuss the specific heat capacity of gases in more detail. Because for such compressible substances, a distinction is necessary as to whether the heat is transferred at constant pressure or constant volume. Depending on this, the specific heat capacity has a different value. Therefore, a distinction is made between the isobaric specific heat capacity CP, which applies to a heat transfer at constant pressure, and the isochoric specific heat capacity CV, which applies to a heat transfer at constant volume. The heating of a closed gas cylinder placed in the sun, for example, represents isochoric heating in which the gas volume remains constant. If, on the other hand, a gas is heated in an open vessel, or the vessel is closed with a frictionless sliding piston, then the gas can expand when heated. In this case, heating takes place at constant pressure. The animation shows an isochoric heating with a tightly screwed piston and, in comparison, an isobaric heat supply in which the piston can move without friction. If the same heat is supplied in both cases, it will be seen that the temperature change is smaller in the isobaric case. In the case of isochoric heating, the transferred heat energy completely benefited the kinetic energy of the molecules, which could thus be fully used to increase the temperature. In the isobaric case, however, the gas had to expand against external forces during heating, such as ambient pressure and the weight of the piston. This expansion of the gas against the external forces requires energy in the form of work. The heat energy supplied must therefore be used in part to increase the volume, and is therefore no longer completely available for increasing the kinetic energy of the molecules, and thus for increasing the temperature. In this case, only the difference between the supplied heat and the work done can be used for the temperature increase. For this reason, in the case of isobaric heating, the temperature change is smaller than in the case of isochoric heating, if the same heat is supplied in both cases. Therefore, in order to still achieve the same temperature change in an isobaric process, where the volume expands strongly, more heat must be supplied. For this reason, the specific heat capacity of the isobaric process is always greater than that of the isochoric process, since a greater amount of heat is required to achieve a certain change in temperature. In the case of solids and liquids, on the other hand, a distinction between a heat transfer at constant pressure or constant volume is not necessary in practice, since the low thermal expansion remains negligible and therefore all heating processes take place in principle at constant volume. One more remark on the concept of heat capacity. The term capacity is intended to describe the ability of a substance to absorb heat without any noticeable change in temperature. In other words, a very high heat absorption capacity without a significant change in temperature. The term capacity is in this respect somewhat misleadingly chosen, because in thermodynamics heat is not considered a state quantity, but a process quantity. There is no capacity of a substance in the sense of a storage of heat. The absorbed heat is stored at an atomic level as internal energy. In this respect, a supply of heat only serves to increase the internal energy, and a removal of heat reduces the internal energy. One final note on the energy unit calorie, which is frequently used in the food industry. This energy unit has its origin in the heating of water. The amount of energy required to increase the temperature of 1 kilogram of water by 1 degree Celsius was defined as 1 calorie. Therefore, 1 calorie corresponds to an energy of 4.2 kilojoules. For this reason, between an energy value in the unit calorie and kilojoule, the conversion factor is 4.2.
I hope you enjoyed the video and found it helpful. Thanks for watching.